So let's talk a little more about getting the diagnosis. Um, you have had a variety of diagnoses with your children, um, some harder than others, and there's just those memories of evaluation and getting the diagnosis. I know for us it's captured in time as a still moment that lasted forever and that we'll never forget. Um, but also those emotions that you that you feel and you never forget. What was that like for, for you? You know, for us it was pretty positive, honestly. Um, you know, again, we kind of look at it as a moment in time, um, just like you had mentioned, Harriet, and looking at, okay, how do we get this information and use this as, as uh, uh, one piece of our decision making to, to make, you know, optimize our, our path moving forward. Um, sometimes it is hard to hear. You know, there, there are some, some things that as a parent, you know, you say, well, that's not fair, you know, or that's not, you know, that can't be right. Um, but the delivery and the, um, uh, the amount of, of time that the clinician takes I think makes a lot of difference mm -hmm. and I know it's a challenge because everybody is different every family that walks through those doors mm -hmm. is different some people might be angry or you know absolutely um, rejecting it you know that can't be it um, and other times they're more accepting in our case we kind of knew sort of you know the the path we were on where at least we felt like you know we we're on this path and Putting a label on it helps us to to look forward, but it wasn't a shocking aha moment for us. You know, it's it's not the day you hope for as a parent, for sure. You know, I mean, it's not what you think of, you know, as you're thinking about, you know, let's start a family. But once you're there, you know, you're there, and you gotta step up and you know be carry the load. The way the diagnosis is delivered can make all the difference in the way a parent accepts, handles, chooses to move through that and become an advocate. I think that is just the paramount issue in how the diagnosis is delivered. And when you get a wrong diagnosis or you don't accept it because it wasn't delivered well, then you're delayed. It sidetracks you for some period of time before oh, yeah. you are able to yeah. go back in and revisit you know, what is going on and get For back sure. on track. The critical moment in the feedback seems to be providing the actual diagnosis. Sometimes the family can be waiting for a really, really long time to, to kind of get that news. And like you mentioned, it can be a pretty emotional point in the evaluation. So there have to be so many different ways to approach this. And what do you think is the best way to go about providing that information? Well, so I think generally, um, you know, a lot of it is really about timing and, and trying to meet a family's needs. Many families are very anxious and they want to hear the diagnosis and they're not going to hear a lot of what you have to say until they hear mm -hmm. where, what the diagnosis is and what the final decision is, basically. On the other hand, it's hard to hear a lot of things after you've gotten that mm -hmm. diagnosis, too, because it's often a very difficult diagnosis for families to hear. So you have to kind of balance both those things. For me, what I like to make sure that I've covered before I get to the diagnosis is a little bit of a review, again, so parents do know what have we covered, who did it, why were we doing that, what were the questions, um, and then talking about a child's strengths, mm -hmm. making sure that they have heard all the wonderful things we saw during this evaluation. Um, some of that might again be um, summarizing what parents have told us, and importantly things that we've actually seen, behaviors and skills we've seen during the evaluation. And then I pretty much get to it usually mm -hmm. for most families. And it's always going to vary and you have to use clinical judgment. So there will be some families who need to hear it even sooner than that or who need much more of a kind of lead in to mm -hmm. um, the various aspects of the evaluation and even maybe again thinking about ASD more explanation of what autism is and what we look for before we actually get to that. But I would say generally, most parents want to hear. Mm -hmm. So I cover those two key areas first, and then I kind of get there. And then I give parents a chance to process and 
have some feelings about that before we start talking more about the diagnosis. It's interesting. I think we have evolved the same process without, mm -hmm. you know, necessarily trying to do it that way. Yeah. Um, but I do always start off, you know, when I sort of shift in my head to now we're in the feedback, I always tell the parent, okay, now we're in the feedback part of the program. And this is the part where, in general, you want to get the main idea of what I'm saying, and it's your chance to ask questions. But you don't have to memorize everything I'm saying because you'll get a nice report later that will tell you all of these things. And so, and that, you know, puts a lot of parents who were poised with their pen and pencil, you know, ready to write everything down, they relax a little bit and they think, okay, so I'm just going to absorb this. Um, but then there really is always something cute or wonderful or surprising about the kid that you can appreciate with the parent in beginning the feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and I always, I teach this to students too because I think it helps the parent to know that we see the whole kid and we're not just ticking off symptoms. Um, you know, either I tell them a cute thing that the kid said or I appreciate how great the kid is to play with. He can really play. Um, um, something genuine. There's always something. Um, and I think that that is deeply appreciated by mm -hmm. parents. And so that comes early. But then I'm like you. I start with the punchline and I tell them that I'm going to do that. And then I say, and then we'll talk about how we get there. Because I agree, they're sitting on the edge of their seat sometimes waiting, is it or isn't it? Are we going to get services or aren't we? Um, was I right or was I wrong to bring them in? And so I don't think you can leave them on the edge of their seat too long, except in certain cases when you need to be more delicate. So hearing what you had to say made me think about a couple of other things too. So I agree with you, I let parents know about the report. Also, I usually have something to hand parents at the mm -hmm. end of the session, whether it's a resource notebook or a short list of um, the diagnoses and a list of recommendations. So I let them know that. Um, if, we're, if I'm seeing a family for feedback and it's not the same day, I always like to check in and see how did things go from the time of the evaluation to the feedback session. Has anything changed? Anything I need to know about? Um, and how, how are things for the child after the evaluation? Because mm -hmm. it's a really long, hard day. Mm -hmm. um, and so I like to kind of check in about that as well. When I talk about strengths too, I also try to, besides talking about a child's strengths, I like to talk about the family strength. Mm -hmm. um, so I thank them for coming and I acknowledge that it's a hard thing to do, that a lot of families can't do what they did, which is bring their child in and have them evaluated and mm -hmm. get to this process. Um, and, and usually there are things, other things besides actually having been part of the evaluation process that a family's done that's been really helpful mm -hmm. for their child. And I like to mention some family strengths before I go into the diagnosis as well. That's nice. Have you ever had an experience where the diagnosis was given to you and you were early enough in the process that you, you had an upwelling of emotion and actually cried? Tracy, you're looking yeah. at me yeah. in a way that tells me that you have had that experience. Well, certainly to be given <coughs> difficult news is never easy. And I think um, as parents, we're so invested in our children that yes. And I think a clinician's way of handling that can, can be really critical to the process. And if they reach over and maybe just, you know, give you a touch on the shoulder to let you know that they're supportive of you. And, and that certainly this is difficult news, so it's natural that you might become emotional. So I think those kinds of things are ways to really um, support those hearing difficult things. This is not easy to hear or to deliver. Or process. Yes, true. And Absolutely. everyone processes differently. I'm thinking about parents. Oh, no doubt about it. Yeah. It's such a vulnerable moment, it is. You know, and so if you are feeling incredibly emotional, you can really feel exposed and raw. Um, one of our clinicians um, was was talking later about when that when it's really intense for a couple, for example, and they really need some time to process that together, and they're they're having that kind of response. Um, 
that she will sometimes actually step out to give them a little mm -hmm. privacy, which, uh, you know, I think is being very, very sensitive to that moment. They can't always do that, but, you know, mm -hmm. um, when the family really is obviously feeling um, a little raw at that moment and they need to recover mm -hmm. and they need to do that um, with some privacy, then uh, you know I think that's really respectful of her to do. I do too, and that gives you an opportunity to kind of regroup and say, did you hear what I heard and how is that resonating with you? What do you do when, or if and when a parent starts to cry? Well, um, for one thing, I let them cry, cause I, and I mm -hmm. actually expect most families to mm -hmm. cry. So it's, it's something that really does happen a lot. We um, make sure that there's always tissues in the room, because the parents may need that. Um, and I give them permission to do that, and I say, you know, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And then let that be an opening for them to tell me what they're feeling, what their concerns are, what questions they have. Um, what's that brought up for them. Um, so I let them do it. I don't go too quickly into, and I think this is another place where there actually could be, where feedback cannot go as well as you'd mm -hmm. expect, to cut that off too quickly and start talking all about the diagnosis and why that diagnosis was made, or too quickly to comfort a parent mm -hmm. either. We will do that. It's very important to do that, to emphasize strengths and um, let them know that there's good news in all this too and there's, there's reasons for optimism. But I give them a chance to be sad because it's, it's, you know, it's a tough diagnosis mm -hmm. and there's reasons to be sad. I remember that being really hard when I was a new psychologist. The first couple of times parents cried. I felt like I was going to cry. It was, you know, very hard to be with, but you do get more used to being with parents who are sad about a diagnosis, and then you can continue to support them without having to worry about yourself. And um, and I think I agree a lot. I don't know the numbers, but a lot of parents cry. Certainly, the majority. It's just an emotional thing to have your kid evaluated and. Um, easy to do some blaming of yourself for anything that could be going on and so you know a piece of the reassurance that some people are really clear about is you know so what we think is going on is this and we do not think that you know parents have a role in um, mm -hmm. contributing to this diagnosis or um, some people are very clear about that one mm -hmm. um, but I'm like you I let parents cry I don't react as if it's something awful um, if parents acknowledge it themselves, if they, you know, apologize for crying, I say, you know, it's okay, a lot of people cry, it's fine. Um, but then I don't move in to sort of explore a lot about what they're feeling or, because I think that my job really is to talk about the kid and to talk about what needs to get done and that the parent can be a little bit derailed by too much empathy mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of parents can appreciate sort of my not focusing on their being sad and can just accept it as you know it's one of the things that people do people smile people cry people sneeze it's okay um, and we can still move on with our feedback but I probably wouldn't choose that moment to talk about doomsday <laughs> prognostic <laughs> <Right>. information <laughs> No, that's right. So it's really a balance. I mean, you, you want to give parents a chance to do that, but you're right, that can't be the whole rest of the feedback session because there's other important information, information that's going to help a parent be able to cope more with the diagnosis mm -hmm. and move forward that needs to happen. So you want to give parents some time for that, but then you do need to help them move on. And I think some of that ability to do that is by acknowledging the feelings first. Um, providing some explicit reassurance. So I'm one of mm -hmm. those people. I'd say, you know, we mm -hmm. know it's not what parents do. And in fact, mm -hmm. look what you've already done. Mm -hmm. You've already done a lot, and it's clear. Look at the progress your child's made, or just the fact that you're here today mm -hmm. is something that many parents can't do. You've done it. That's already going to have been very helpful for your child. Um, and then to start to remind parents, it's a good place to say, remember I talked about those strengths? Those were real. Mm -hmm. So we've got a diagnosis. It's a hard diagnosis. I understand that you're sad about that, but your child does have strengths, and we're going to talk mm -hmm. about ways to move forward. This is a time now to acknowledge what he needs, to recognize his strengths, and think of ways to capitalize on his strengths while then meeting his needs. Um, and I think those kinds of statements of 
you were sad, but there's ways to move forward, and we're going to help you do that. We're going to help you figure out how to do that, then moves you on to that next phase. Mm -hmm. Diagnosis is just, you know, one small piece of information um, that relates to the, you know, the the all-encompassing um, path, you know, that that the child is on, and uh, you know, it's it's um, it's one piece that helps you make a, a future plan, but it doesn't change anything as far as the current status. I mean, the status 10 minutes before you get your evaluation and 10 minutes after is exactly the same. Child's the same. And so... But your I feelings you take it, about it may be very, very different right. before and after. But for us, it was positive that it's additional information. Mm -hmm. Where we gather information to, you know, try to make good decisions. So, for us, even though sometimes it's hard to hear, in your mind, you really knew, you know, that it's, you know, the the severity or the complexity of it, and then you, you know, you use that as one more piece of information to to move forward. And I know for for us, um, my daughter first started having um, evaluations soon after her first birthday and due to her first evaluation and the feedback being such a positive experience and they did talk a great deal about those things that she could do and the strengths that she had and those potential things that she had capability um, that set up all the then difficult ones where we were talking about deficits and um, those weaknesses that she had, um, that very first one that enhanced her strengths spoke to my confidence in her, my confidence in myself, and competence in, in what we could kind of do together. So I think the initial feedback around strength is probably the most critical thing you do because you don't want parents to lose their sense of confidence and, and confidence. Even when you take all of these steps that you've mentioned, sometimes families just don't believe the diagnosis. What do you do when that happens? Um, well, there's a couple things there. So it's really going to vary um, from family to family, and it's a great question. Hopefully that's not going to happen a lot, that all the things we've just mm -hmm. been talking about and the way to conduct an evaluation and a feedback session will help lay that groundwork. Um, but sometimes it's going to happen anyway. You've done everything you can and the family is just not ready. And then I think it's really going to vary. For some families it might mean stepping back and saying like, okay, well what else do we need to do? Oh, we didn't talk to such and such a person? Well, maybe we need to do that. We need to see your child again. Maybe we need to do that. Um, already a lot of time and energy has been put into an evaluation. My view is if a family needs another hour for an additional mm -hmm. time for me to see their child or for me to talk to someone else or you know, if, if time permits, observe in the school or at least call the school or see a video, I'm going to do that so that all this other work is helpful and leads toward acceptance of a diagnosis. Um, I think though sometimes you also have to think about other strategies. So for some families it might be we have already done all those things or mm -hmm. those things won't make the difference and the family's still going to have difficulty accepting a diagnosis and then we can need to think through why. I think it's important, it's a time when I'll think about cultural differences and how those might be impacting things and if there's another way for me to think about this or who else I can get involved in the feedback session. Maybe a key person who needs to be there to help this family isn't there. So maybe we need another session or we need to involve someone else. Um, it may also be, I need to say that it, depending on how a family says, I don't accept this mm -hmm. and I don't believe this, where that is, it might not matter that much. Because if a family's ready to mm -hmm. take recommendations and go with where we as a team or if I'm working individually as a psychologist think they need to go, I don't know that they need to say, oh, and you're so right, it's just this. And I'll actually sometimes have that conversation with a family mm -hmm. in a very direct way. Um, after all, we've just been saying it's just a label. Mm -hmm. What's important is meeting a child's needs and, and d deciding what are the next steps we need to take, how to help that child. So if a family is willing to do all those things and they say, I'm going to do everything you tell me to do, but I don't believe it. 
I don't think that's why. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it. I will say, that's fine. That's great. Mm -hmm. we're, we're basically thinking the same way because I don't think the label's that important either. What's important is what you do next. So it can go from we're going to do all these other things that we need to do to help you accept this diagnosis to that's fine. That's great. Um, we're, we're both going to, we both agree on next steps. Um, we'll just go from there. So that's what, exactly what I was going to say. You know, does it matter if they right. believe you or not? Right. Because if they're already hooked up with lots of interventions, I don't need to be right for the kid to get better. Um, and so if the kid is doing well and continuing to make progress, it doesn't matter to me um, whether I'm right or wrong according to the parent. But if the parent feels unhappy with not knowing whether the diagnosis is right or wrong, then I would hope that I could continue to be helpful to that family mm -hmm. and maybe help them to um, find a second opinion. You know, I think in an area that wasn't my area of specialty, I might very well seek a second opinion. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. Um, and it's, you know, their prerogative to do that. Um, and I'd hope that I could continue to help them in pursuing that if that's what they need next. You know, it brings up another good point, which is that um, we've been talking about families accepting or not accepting a diagnosis, but sometimes it's one member of the family. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think sometimes that same process needs to happen, where you think about, well, what can we do next? What needs to happen? Um, and sometimes it, it doesn't need to happen because that other family member, the one who disagrees with the diagnosis, is still willing to have the family members who do agree move forward. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to mention that because sometimes that discussion is important to have with a family mm -hmm. where that family can hear just what we've said about like that's okay it's okay if your husband disagrees or if your wife disagrees if they're supportive of you and they're willing to do the things that you think are important to be done and that we've recommended let that person go at their own pace in accepting the diagnosis. So I think some education for families around that, and that can often happen both um, you know, between spouses or it can be a, a generational issue that often comes up. And I think having family members who are wanting other people to agree with them or accept the diagnosis, it's a helpful piece um, to explain. I still think that would be a pretty difficult thing to, to deal with. So how often do you think that actually happens? I don't think it happens very often. And especially as you mm -hmm. learn how to give feedback and you learn <clears throat> how to do the kinds of um, techniques that we're talking about, I don't think it happens very often. I think the other piece of that, though, that's probably important, especially for students and people starting out, is to... Um, to be a little more objective about that and a little less defensive about it. Mm -hmm. So there'll be things to learn because oftentimes if a feedback doesn't go well, there are things to look back on and I've certainly done that. Mm -hmm. thought, well, maybe if I'd done this instead, it would have gone better. So you learn and maybe that's something you can even talk with the family about and repair or certainly then you know, carry it on for the next family who will benefit from that. But also for some families it's just really difficult no matter what you've done. And so you need to be less defensive about that, be professional about that, mm -hmm. try to help the family, and not take it personally. Um, I think that's another place where things could go wrong and feedback if you feel mm -hmm. like, you know, I've done all this work and I did a good job and I did everything everyone told me to do and you're not believing what I said and you should. Um, so something, you know, we have to fix this. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, maybe not. Maybe that's just the process and you've, you've done a great job and even if you had some things you would do differently, that's okay too. You have to let this family accept things at their pace and at the, at the rate they're going. And I think that helps too because I do think families can pick up on a feeling of, oh no, you know, I gave you this diagnosis, you need to say yes, as opposed to the stance we were just taking of like, that's okay, you, you don't have to agree. Mm -hmm. And I would agree, it doesn't happen to me very often um, that I know about, and I hope that I would know. Good point. <laughs> um, you know, we don't always check in afterward, but um, I can only think of a couple of times when the parent was just rejecting of a diagnosis or of my findings. and. One was when I was very new at this job, um, and the second one was more recent, but that was a parent who couldn't tolerate observing mm, for whatever reason, um, just kind of refused all opportunities that were presented to observe. Um, and so 
you know, probably it was a pretty difficult thing for that parent to even think about there being difficulties in any of these areas. Um, and in that case, I was able to help them to find a good provider who could maybe provide a second opinion. And so I hope that I at least laid the groundwork for the second provider who, you know, may or may not have different findings. Well, that's a great point, and I think that's another thing you could keep in mind if you have a feedback that hasn't quite gone the way you want, is that you probably have laid the groundwork for the next person, um, even if you can't directly make that referral. So sometimes we're in the position of we're the ones making that second opinion, mm -hmm. um, or we're evaluating someone where someone else had the hard job of saying, you know, I think you better have your child evaluated for an autism spectrum disorder. It's a tough position to be in. We're then in that position of saying, like, okay, we agree. It was good that you brought your mm -hmm. child in. But sometimes we might be on the other end of, for whatever reason, we're the first people saying it, and that family's not ready to hear that yet. Again, no fault of ours, no fault of theirs. It's just where they are in the process. Um, but you know that you've been honest and direct. You've provided a good um, experience for the family and the child. And when they go to the next person, who will then um, most likely confirm your diagnosis. That family's heard it, they're, they're gonna be able to go to another person mm -hmm. and, and have that evaluation and then maybe they'll accept it. So sometimes thinking through where you might be in a family's process can help with that too. So it seems like this part of the feedback can go really differently for each family. And so what I've heard you say so far is that you know, it's really important to really include the family as part of the evaluation from the very beginning and make sure that you're constantly thinking about the feedback and how that's going to go from, from the start of the evaluation. And, you know, I guess you also mentioned that it's been really important to be as transparent as you possibly can and, you know, tell the family what it is that you're doing and why it is that you're doing that and starting off the feedback session with the strengths and you know letting them know that they are going to be receiving a report so that they can just try and sit there and, and process as much information as possible. And you also mentioned that really starting off with the punchline or the bottom line is the way to go and providing as much feed, or providing as much empathy as the family needs are really important components up until this point. So are there other things that you think are really important to remember? I think you've really done a nice job of summarizing the key points of um, where we are in the process of talking about feedback. Mm -hmm. 